our speaker tonight was the first layman to receive both his licentiate and doctoral degrees in ascetical and mystical theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum in Rome. He has taught at St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, and at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. A Knight Grand Cross in the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre and consultor to the Pontifical Council for the Family, which he was just reconfirmed in uh, by Pope Benedict XVI. He is the author of Hearts of the Redeemer and Swords Around the Cross, The Nine Years' War. He has filmed many programs for EWTN and currently lives with his, with his wife, Kathy, and nine children in Stevens City, Virginia. And he is also an advisor on the advisory board of the Institute of Catholic Culture. We're very indebted to Dr. O'Donnell. Please welcome Dr. O'Donnell this evening. You can stick this in your pocket. Well, good evening to all of you. It's great to be back here uh, and to see you all. And I'm so happy I'm not speaking in Lent. How many of you are still in the Christmas spirit? All right, I'm happy to see that because it's kind of hard not to be when you're doing Luke's infancy narrative. Uh, but I was happy to hear that we're still in, in, particularly in Easter, we're still in the Christmas season, very much so. And I think even in the Latin church, there is that tradition of lingering it out, stretching it out till February 2nd, where I think that's the final day where you really do need to get rid of the Christmas tree at that time. But, uh, but you can really stretch it out to February 2nd, Candlemas, and I know that because out at the college, the choir always sings Joy to the World as the entrance song on February 2nd. So, uh, well, uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. Uh, and I'm happy to be sharing uh, a little bit of the Gospel of Luke with you today, and, uh, or tonight rather, uh, especially since the next topic that he actually assigned me, the fall of Jerusalem, is rather dark and dismal. There's a beautiful side to it, but it's a rather painful uh, subject in more ways than one. So I'm very happy uh, to be with you tonight. And so he wanted me to talk about the infancy narratives in, in St. Luke. And of course, that's just the first two chapters. So what I thought I would do tonight, if you have your Bible, just take it out. And I would just sort of go through verse by verse, those first two chapters, talking about them, giving you some background, making some comments. And then at the end of that, if there's, we'll take a break, I understand, for like three minutes, so those who can't take it anymore can leave. And then um, there'll be a chance for questions. Does that sound good to everybody? All right. Since we've already invoked the Lord's blessing, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Gospel of Luke and then jump right into it. Gospel of Luke is truly a remarkable work of literature, even prescinding from the fact that it is inspired literature. I remember some person once came up and asked, do you know of a good life of Christ that I could read? And you know what my answer would be? The Gospel of Luke. Have you tried the Gospel of Luke? Because it starts off with the infancy and goes all the way through. It is one of the most beautiful books ever written. And it's interesting that it's really written by someone who is a minor figure in Christian history, right? St. Luke. We don't know a lot about him. He's, a, he's not Peter, Paul. He's not one of the apostles or anything like that. And yet he wrote the gospel and Acts. About one-fourth of the text in our New Testament is by this man, Luke. And it's important to remember that he is the only non-Jewish New Testament writer. Everything else in the New Testament is written by Jews. He is a Gentile. So in a very real sense... This should be sort of like our gospel, since we're all Gentiles here. I think, maybe not, but okay, we're the new Israel too, that's true. But it is so beautiful because it is a gospel of prayer. It is a gospel of women, because there are a number of very significant women in this gospel, and Luke always makes a point of giving the names of these women in his gospel. It is also a gospel of mercy, in which the mercy of our Lord is communicated in such a profound, rich, and beautiful way. And it's also a great gospel of universality. Of course, Luke was a disciple of St. Paul, and the universality of the Christian message, that it's meant for everyone. Those are key themes that are found uh, in this beautiful gospel. Now, if you open up your text, let's go to start with the prologue. We'll deal with the prologue, which are just verses 1 to 4. And kind of, it's beautiful because right at the very beginning, 
He tells you the occasion of his writing, the sources he's using, the method he's using, and the purpose he's giving you in his history, all in this first little compact thing. And scholars who look at this say he was a very educated man. We know he was a doctor. As a matter of fact, there are a number of medical terms that are used only in Luke's gospel, which help identify him as a physician. But we know he could write beautiful, flawless classical Greek. As a matter of fact, the first four verses are very much like if you were to read classical Greek in Herodotus or Thucydides. It's that same type of form. But what Luke is telling us right at that beginning, that he's writing as a historian. Christianity is not a myth. It's not something that was invented out of the East. He's writing as a historian about real people, real events that took place. And so he starts off. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to drop a narrative concerning the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now notice that. That's a big thing for him. Things that have been fulfilled. All the expectation in the Old Testament. All of the prophecies. Even from the pagan point of view, the longing in the human heart. That deep longing for love. All of these are finding in fulfillment... He says, even as they who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have handed them down to us. So he tells you why he's writing, his purpose. He's basing it upon people who were eyewitnesses, people who saw what? Real people, things that really happened. And they were ministers of the word from the very beginning and have handed them down to us. Then he also says, I also have determined after following up all things carefully from the very first to write for thee, most excellent Theophilus, an orderly account that thou mayest understand the certainty of the words in which thou hast been instructed. Do you see how Luke is concerned about truth? Do you pick that up as you listen to those words and hopefully that resonates with you? He's very much concerned about the certitude of what Theophilus... Now, we don't know who Theophilus was. Most excellent was a title you would give to a high-placed Roman official. A procurator would be called most excellent. All right? But the words that he's been instructed... Now, notice that this is a very important passage for us. He talks about those things that have been handed down to us. That's where we get our word traditio, tradition. Things that are handed down to us. Notice also that Theophilus has already been instructed in the truths of the faith and that the gospel was preached orally. People were catechized orally even before it was written down as it is in this document. Does that make sense to everybody? Why is that important? Because the thing that's on the scene first is the church. The church comes first. And then the church receives the gospel, and then the church preaches the gospel, and then the gospel is written down. A lot of times people think, oh, the Bible comes first, and then the church comes out of the Bible. Wrong. It's the exact opposite. The church exists, receives the word, communicates the word, and then the gospels come out of the church. So this beautiful account. Now, that prologue is written in this beautiful, sort of precise, classical Greek. Now, it's very interesting. As soon as you get into verse 5, that changes. And a lot of scripture scholars say the reason it changes is because Luke is no longer writing in sort of classical Greek here. He's going back to Hebrew sources, conversations that he had. He's talked to people who were eyewitnesses. Now, one of the big witnesses that most scholars agree that he certainly spoke to is the Blessed Mother herself. That's one of the reasons why this infancy narrative, as found in Luke, is so beautiful. And you know why it's so beautiful? Because it's so feminine. Guys, you're with me on this, aren't you? All right? It's very, very feminine. Unlike Matthew that emphasizes Joseph and sort of the official Jewish uh, Kerygma proclamation of the gospel, here you have a very feminine touch. Everything's intuitive. Everything's reflective. And there's a beautiful sensitivity that seems to come from the fact that Luke himself, since he said he followed everything up carefully, even with those who were eyewitnesses from the very beginning. Remember, Mary doesn't just die after Jesus dies, right? She lives for a considerable period of time. And you don't find her as a minor figure. Remember the day of Pentecost? Where are the apostles? 
there in the upper room with Mary. She's sitting in the center. She's the mother of the church. Now, if you were going to write a life about someone who was the son of God, who would you talk to? You'd talk to the mother. I mean, it's almost unnatural to think that no one ever came up to Mary and said, what happened? What was he like as a child? And we'll see a couple things stick out (laughs) in this infancy narrative that she reflects upon. So let's go on from there. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zachary of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were just before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. So we're going to start the story going even further back to get the history of the precursor. And we start off with Zachary and Elizabeth. Now notice, they're not, they're not only of noble lineage, because they're descendant of Aaron, all right, on both sides, on both sides, which is very significant. A priestly family. He was of the course of Abia. Now, what does that mean? Well, there were certain uh, priestly rotations that took place in the temple, and he was of that particular course, descendant of Abia. Now, not only did they have a noble lineage, but notice also they're noble in the life of virtue, too. It's not just that they're from a priestly family, but they're also walking blamelessly in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. So they're very devout. But then something that would have just hit really, really hard, especially in Jewish culture back then. But they had no son, for Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. That was like total failure. Do you know if you did not have a son, did not have a child, that was grounds for divorce in Jewish culture back then. That was a great cross to bear. Now, the fact that they never did divorce shows you something about the beauty of the love between those two. They had never had a son, and he could have divorced, but they stayed together. They stayed together, but that was a cross. Now, it came to pass, let's continue on, while he was officiating in the order of his course as priest before God, according to the custom of the priest office, that he was chosen by law to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense. Now, this is a big thing. There would have been about 20,000 priests in Israel back at that time. And so the likelihood of you being selected by lot to enter temple and burn incense would have been rare. Not everyone got to do that. The high priest, the great high priest, went in on the Day of Atonement actually into the Holy of Holies, and it was such a terrifying thing that they actually tied a rope around his leg as he went behind the curtain into the presence of the Lord God, seeking pardon for the people's sins. And in case he died in there, they had the rope around the leg so they could pull him out because no one else wanted to go in there. Sort of a spiritual Wizard of Oz, you know. Pay no attention to the man. No, okay, sorry, sorry. Bad joke, bad joke. Erase that from the tape. All right. (laughs) But you get the sense. It was a sense of the aloofness and the power and the majesty of God. Now, you have to know a little bit about the temple. We'll talk more about the temple next time I come back. But there was about a 60-foot-long rectangular building, and then there was a perfect cube behind that, and there was the great curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the temple. And you had five of those large menorah candlesticks that were lit. And then right in front of the curtain was the altar of incense where they would burn incense. And just off to the right was the altar of the showbreads where every morning they would break the breads for the 12 tribes and they would be set there to give glory to the Lord God. Now, incense was burned either very early in the morning or at sunset. That was the hour of sacrifice, early in the morning or early in the evening. We're not really told what the time was, but it was just the time to burn incense. I think it was morning. But that's because we're talking about newness, good news, etc. So I think it was probably the morning incense. Now, none of the people could go in there, and none of the priests went in there unless you were selected to be the one guy to burn incense. So this would have been, as a priest, to have gotten the law by lot, to be chosen to be the one to burn incense, this would have been an incredibly fulfilling, joyful moment for him as he walks in there with the incense before the curtain to burn it in front of the Holy of Holies. Now, of course, it helps you to understand the fact that no one else is supposed to be in there. All right? So if you're in there alone doing this and then some, suddenly someone speaks to you, 
you can see why you would almost jump out of your skin. What's going on here? This is my day. No one else should be here. All right? And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And the incense symbolizes the prayer of the people of God ascending up into heaven. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right of the altar of incense. And Zachary, seeing him, was troubled, and fear fell upon him. In the presence of the angel, of course, this angel manifests the glory of God. There's probably a natural fear, like, why is he here? But then also in terms of his countenance and message, this would have been something that would have been terrifying. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Isn't that a great thing to hear? Do not be afraid. Immediately disarming, okay? Get rid of fear. Remember John Paul used to say that all the time? Be not afraid. And so many times we're afraid of so many things. And isn't it a beautiful thing when the angel comes from God, first thing out of his mouth, be not afraid. Be not afraid. So that presence, that presence there that is consoling. But he says, be not afraid, Zachary, for thy petition has been heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great before the Lord. He shall drink no wine or strong drink, and shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he shall bring back to the Lord their God many of the children of Israel, and he shall himself go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the incredulous to the wisdom of the just to prepare for the Lord a perfect people. So this is going to be a moment of preparation, a moment of joy, and he's not to be afraid. Now, it's interesting they say his petition has been heard. Now, a lot of people are divided. What petition? Most exegetes say he was praying for a child. All right? And I think that's probably true, and that petition is being granted. But if they're both really old and advanced in years, do you think they're still praying for a child? I don't think so, especially judging from his attitude to the angelic message. All right? <laughs> What it might be, and there are some exegetes that are saying, what they're really, they probably prayed early in their marriage for a child and child, now they're advancing years. They're not praying that. What are they praying for? Messiah to come. And so in a certain sense, he's getting even more than he had prayed for. He's going to get a child, and he's going to get a child who will also be the Son of God. You know? God is never a down in generosity. If he was just praying for a child, he's not only going to get a child, he's also going to get another child, and his kid's going to be the precursor. So the answer to this prayer is going to give him joy. And joy, why? Because so many people will rejoice at his birth. Notice how many times, just like St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians, joy rejoicing. Joy is always the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. The world has happy hours, Right? that aren't so happy at the bars. You know what I'm talking about? But they don't have joy hours because joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So that's one thing. Now, of course, he's not going to drink wine. That kind of depresses me, or strong drink. Strong drink, by the way, is distilled liquor, and I'm Irish, so that kind of bothers me too. But I'm all for it. It's great. We're talking about heavy stuff, right? So there's no drink in this man's but young boy's background at all. He's going to be consecrated, filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't need other spirits because he's filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Now, remember that verse, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, because in a little bit later, we're going to see a concrete example of him being filled from the mother's womb. All right? But the great thing is he shall bring back to the Lord many of the children of Israel. All right? And go forward in the spirit and the power of Eliza. And imagine this beautiful thing. He'll turn the hearts of fathers to their children. Isn't that beautiful? In this day and age, where so much, there's so much confusion about what's it mean to be a man, what's it mean to be a father, he's going to turn the father's hearts back to their children. It means there's something been frozen, there's something missing here. So once again, restoring relationships in the family. And of course, isn't that cool? Father's hearts to their children, of course, what's he going to get? A child. He himself is going to be a father. See, the more... The more you spend time with this, the more you prayerfully think about it, it just gets deeper and deeper and richer. On a supernatural level and even on a human level, he's going to rejoice because of this child. 
all right? And the incredulous will be brought to the wisdom of the just. Those who resist, those who do not believe, will finally be brought to the wisdom of the just, of those who believe, those who live the faith and are living in a righteous way. And that will be a glorious thing, and the Lord will have a perfect people prepared for him. And Zachary said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Okay, not the right thing to say. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to thee and to bring to thee this good news. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and unable to speak until the day when these things come to pass, because thou hast not believed my words, which will be fulfilled, there's that word again, fulfilled, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. All right. What's the problem? What's the problem? He clearly believed in the angel, but it seems that he might have doubted God's almighty power to work this. And there are Old Testament precedents, aren't there? I mean, he's a priest. Did he know his Old Testament? Did he know Abraham and Sarah? And there are other examples, too. Hannah and people like that. Okay, so he seemed to doubt there. And so because of that, he struck dumb. He can't speak. Now imagine, guys, you could not speak for over nine months. Have you ever done a silent retreat for a weekend? They say women are talkers. I want to tell you, all right? Get the guys to be quiet for three days, and when you have that meal, when you're ready to go, it's just, wah, 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 wah. how about them bears? Who do you think won? Totally non-substantive, because guys are frivolous. We know that, but that's okay. The women still love us anyway. I don't know why. So he doubted. And so it's interesting that the sign, it's not so much a punishment as it is a sign that he will be unable to speak, right? The tongue is tied by lack of faith. When the faith is restored, the tongue will be untied, as we will see, when all things come to pass. But you realize that all things is not just the birth. It's the birth in the chosen people because it's the circumcision moment that actually unties the tongue, as we will see. And the people were waiting for Zachary, and they wondered at his tearing so long in the temple. But when he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them, but he remained dumb, unable to speak because of this. So we go on. And it came to pass, when the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now, in the days of the service, you were expected to be celibate. If you were a priest, you lived celibacy while you were at the temple. You had no relations with a woman. So, days of the service done, he goes home. Obviously, they had relations. Now, after three days, Elizabeth, his wife, conceived, and she concluded her, con- secluded herself for five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days when he deigned to take away my reproach from among men. Imagine what a cross this must have been for her. All of her life, married, and never a child. And sometimes God allows that. But a lot of times, like John Paul observed once, that there was an even greater blessing, a greater calling that you're being called to if you're not being blessed with children. All right? But that's part of the whole discernment. But her, in in her old age, now conceives a child. Pregnancy is tough on any woman at any time, right? It's difficult. Babies are great. Pregnancy is a drag. That's what my my wife, anyway. Okay. If you get morning sickness, we didn't call it. She called it morning sickness, but it was all day sickness for five months with the first. It did get a little better as we went on. I think boy pregnancies are worse than girl pregnancies. I don't know why that is, but anyway. So the reproach taken away. So already there's joy. And the joy is found in the wife and new life. And see, so much of this stuff, Christianity is such a domestic religion. It's about families. It's about babies. It's about children. It's about life. And that's why John Paul wrote that Evangelium Vitae, the gospel of life. And Luke was one of the great inspirations of that because it is so filled with life, supernatural life and natural life. Because remember, grace builds upon nature, as St. Thomas tells us. Now we go on from there. That was five months she hides herself away. Now in the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Her pregnancy. See, everything's revolving around life and the child and precursor. Isn't that beautiful? So even when we talk about God coming, it's related to Elizabeth's pregnancy. Isn't that beautiful? 
God is so into the domestic church. He really is. He's really into this. I mean, he didn't have to come himself into a family, but he chose to. That in itself should tell us so much about the importance of family and our relationships with one another, and why there, when there is brokenness and woundedness in family, one of the great things that Christian vocation should be is to bring healing and to bring people back together again, just like Zachary and Elizabeth were brought together again, and in their old age find the joy of this incredible blessing coming from God. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, same one that went, so we have these sort of parallel images in Luke, all right, was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth. A city so obscure, it's never mentioned once in the entire Old Testament. Total obscurity. I mean, the humility of God. I mean, the more you go into this, the more we look at this. The incredible humility of God. Everything that he does just constantly is revealing this phenomenal humility When he finally holds up the two virtues that he wants everyone to learn, he points to his own heart. What does he say? Learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. His two greatest virtues, meekness and humility. This is the God-man. All right. So to Nazareth, a nothing. To a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, Miriam, the exalted one. Of course, she is the exalted one, but she's the one who is the most humble. And, and of course, Luke here used the word for strict virgin. She was a virgin. She had had no relations with a man. And when the angel had come to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. With all deference to our Protestant brothers and sisters, There is no woman in the Old Testament anywhere who's addressed like that. This is the biblical foundation for the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The angel comes, and even though the angel has a superior nature in the order of nature, looking at Mary says, Hail, full of grace, full of divine favor, full of divine life. The Lord is with thee. The angel's the messenger, but she has the Lord. She is full of divine life, Father, Son, and Spirit. And then she goes, the angel goes on, Blessed art thou among women, of all women, most blessed. All right. When she had heard him, she was troubled at his word and kept pondering what manner of greeting this might be. Now notice, why is she troubled? She's so humble. You know, when you meet people are really humble. When they're praised, it's almost like, what? You know, she doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about herself. She says, what could that mean? That's what she's troubled at, all right? And she keeps pondering, and this word for pondering implies a serious, intense reflection. She's dwelling, how long was the Annunciation? We don't know. But it might have lasted for a period of time. So she reflects upon this, ponders, what does this mean? She's already filled with the Holy Spirit. An angel appears and addresses you this way. Can you see how this would just be caught up in this beautiful reflective moment as God's messenger radiating God's glory? And yet the angel, who is God's messenger, and she recognizes Gabriel as God's messenger, speaks of her as filled with grace, most blessed among women. Remarkable. So we go on, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, so the name Savior. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he shall be king over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Finding grace, son of the most high, the Lord God will give him the throne and he will reign forever and ever. Did Mary know that her offspring was going to be God? I think so. She knew the Old Testament. There's a wonderful priest by the name of Father William Most. He's dead now. Did a lot of research. 
and what were called the Jewish Targums, which were commentaries by the rabbis in Aramaic on the prophets. And these were read in all of the synagogues, second century, first century BC. And boy, some of those rabbis got a sense that this Messiah, when he came, was going to be a divine being. Like they struggled because they didn't understand the Trinity. But then when they would read passages from Isaiah, we're not that far removed from Christmas, so remember your handle, right? And he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. He will be called Yahweh. What does that mean? You see, the rabbis, they don't have the full knowledge of the Trinity, but he must have a special, this man will have a special, he will be divine in some way. All right? And yet Mary, is, who is, remember, filled with grace, now has this message from an angel. But Mary said to the angel, How shall this happen since I do not know man? Meaning having no relations with a man. It implies that she, a lot of commentators believe she had a vow of virginity. It would not have been uncommon at this time. Other people had taken vows of virginity, but that can be maybe something we can deal with in the question and answer. Now notice, this is not a denial like you get with Zachary. It's, how will this be? I know you can do it. How will this be? She is the woman of faith. How will this be since I do not know man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Very important expression, shall overshadow thee. And therefore the Holy One to be born shall be called the Son of God. So there is no male involved in this, right? Remember back the proto-gospel way back in Genesis, Genesis 3, 16? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. The only time anywhere in Scripture there's reference to the feminine seed. Every other time it's the male seed. But it's referred to just as the feminine seed. Why? There is no male seed involved. It's the virginal conception. So the Holy Spirit will overshadow thee. Now that we're overshadowing recalls the Shekinah in the Hebrew, which was the great cloud. When Moses went up to receive the law, the cloud covered the mountain, right? When there was the tent of meeting, the ark was there, the cloud covered it. When Solomon built the temple, the Shekinah, the cloud of the presence of the Lord, filled the temple. So what are we being told here? The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. So what is she going to become? She's going to become the new tabernacle. She's going to become the new tabernacle. Think of it. You know, John Paul spent so much of his life praying to Mary, meditating on Mary, and reading the gospel. One of the beautiful things in his encyclical on the Eucharist, he said, Mary was a woman of the Eucharist her whole life. Everything in Mary's life was Eucharist. And this is no exception. This is no exception, and we'll see why. So, behold, Elizabeth thy kinswoman has conceived a son in her old age. That's the sign. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing shall be impossible with God. See the rebuke of Zachary? For nothing shall be impossible with God. It's already happened, and that's a sign. You're going to find that your kinswoman Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And Mary said... Behold the handmaid of the Lord, the humility. Handmaid literally is trying to say, behold the slave girl, the little slave girl. She's just been told the most incredible thing in the world. This is our Angelus prayer. We pray at noon. Most incredible thing. And what does she say? Nothing about herself. Behold the handmaid, the little slave girl of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. I'm all yours. Whatever you want, I am there for you. So beautiful. So feminine. So we go, and then the angel departed from her. So we have two angelic apparitions, one in the temple to Zachary, now another one in Nazareth, but to a new temple, right? To a new tabernacle. And theologians tell us, and it says, the moment she pronounces her fiat, be it done unto me according to thy word, bingo, Jesus, the Son of God, is conceived in her. So what does she have inside of her? the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So what does that make her? A tabernacle. She is a walking tabernacle. 
When she goes off to see her cousin, it's the first Eucharistic procession in history. She probably wasn't showing too much, but, you know, she, maybe she was proud sticking up. No, she wasn't proud. We know that. <laughs> but so she goes off. So what does she do? Now, in those days, we're on verse 39. Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a town of Judah. And she entered the house of Zachary and saluted Elizabeth. Now, notice a couple of things. One, she goes in haste. She's heard about her kinswoman, so she wants to go and help. And like any time you receive Jesus, what do you do? You got to share the news with somebody. And so you go in haste. So Mary goes in haste. We're going to see later when the angels appear to the shepherds, what do the shepherds do? They go in haste, right? When God's grace is given, we are strengthened. We are given power, right? And so Mary goes in haste to share what? The good news of this gospel, the joy of the news about Elizabeth and about herself. And she salutes Elizabeth. And it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe in her womb leapt. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and cried out with a loud voice saying, Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And how have I deserved that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, the moment the sound of thy greeting came to my ears, notice the sound of thy greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leapt for joy, which is a fruit of Holy Spirit. That's why theologians say original, John lost original sin at that moment. Now there's a lot going on here. Notice she says, blessed art thou among women. The same thing that the angel said to her, right? So she's praised by angels, and she's praised by, by human beings, by Elizabeth, with the same beautiful greeting. Blessed among women. She's the glory of our race and the glory of the angels. So much is revealed. Now notice again, this is a scriptural foundation of to Jesus through Mary, right? Because it's when Elizabeth hears whose voice? Mary's voice that the Holy Spirit is communicated and the babe in her womb leaps. Why? Because Mary has within her what? The body, blood, soul, and divinity. The Lord is present. Mary makes Jesus present. Mary brings us to Jesus. And when Mary speaks, the Holy Spirit comes forth because why? It comes through Jesus and the babe in the womb leaps for joy. Leaps for joy. And that's interesting because you know you're going to find the Holy Spirit again at Pentecost with Mary right there in the center the Mater Ecclesia, the mother of the church. And so she goes on, the moment these, I heard your voice, the babe in my womb left. And then she goes on to say, and blessed is she who has believed because the things promised her by the Lord shall be accomplished. Notice it's not you're the mother of a fetus or an embryo or anything like that. She's the mother of my Lord. Mother of my Lord, recognizing the divine presence within her. And it is a cause for joy. And Mary is what? She who has believed, contrasted with Zachary, who did not believe. So she is the one who believes. That's why later on where that woman, looking at Jesus and seeing how handsome and magnificent he was, cries out, blessed is the breast that nursed you and the womb that bore you. Remember that? What Jesus says, more blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. She heard the word of God and she kept it, literally, in her womb because the word was made flesh. Is this making sense? Okay, so incredible Mary. Now she gives her beautiful prayer, her Magnificat. Now notice again the greatness of Mary. She has just received all of this incredible praise from Elizabeth. She's the mother of her Lord, all right? Most blessed among women. What does she say? My soul magnifies the Lord. See? Who is she immediately turning attention to? Away from herself. My soul magnifies the Lord. You look at me, may it magnify Him. All right? My spirit rejoices in God my Savior because He has regarded what? The lowliness of His handmaid. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. 
Can there be anything more incongruous than someone who claims the name Christian who doesn't say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Because remember, Elizabeth says that filled with the Holy Spirit. She's inspired by the Spirit. How can we not praise our Blessed Mother? Can we ever say enough about Mary? According to Luke, I don't think so. So notice the humility immediately turning everything. Why? Because he who is mighty has done great things for me. Who's done it? He has. It's nothing in me. It's him. But the more she manifests her humility, the greater she becomes. Does that make sense? I mean, the more the abasement, the greater the glorification. That's why even at the Feast of the Baptism, Jesus is debased. He looks like a sinner. He goes down in the water. He humiliates himself. He looks like a sinner, just like he will on the cross. But what do we hear the Father say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that incredible? All right. So we go on from there. And his mercy is from generation to generation. Holy is his name on those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm and has scattered the proud and the conceit of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has given help to Israel, his servant, mindful of his mercy. Notice two times she says, mercy, mercy. His merciful love. I mean, a God who can become a baby, a God who can become incarnate in Mary's womb. What else do we need? Talk about merciful love. Sometimes when Jesus is doing the public ministry, it's too big, but everybody can get their arms around a baby. Who's afraid of a baby, really? But his love is so merciful that he condescends to enter into the womb and become a baby. So this beautiful, magnificat, all the glory given to the Father. But notice also scattering the proud of the conceit of the heart, exalting the lowly, filling the hungry, sending the rich away empty. It sounds almost a little bit like Sermon on the Mount. A little bit like the Sermon on the Mount. Continuity between Mary and her inspired prayer and what Jesus himself will teach. All right. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now, if she conceived in the sixth month, just do the math. Add three more. What month are we at? Ninth month. Was she there for the birth? Yes. That's why Luke knows all the stuff that's going on. Now, Elizabeth's time was fulfilled that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and kinfolk heard the Lord had magnified his mercy. There we are again. His mercy towards her. And they rejoiced with her. Everything is joy, mercy, Joy and mercy. This is the proper attitude in terms of life, human life, natural life, and the supernatural life that is given as well. And it came to pass on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him by his father's name, Zachary. Zachary doesn't want that anymore. And his mother answered and said, Not so, he shall be called John. Isn't that interesting? He shall be called John. John means the Lord is gracious. That's what it means. The Lord is gracious. In other words, his prayer was answered. Prayer was answered. And so he shall be called John. So notice Elizabeth comes up and says this for her husband. And they said to her, there is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. It's not tradition, not tradition, but there's something new that is going on here. And they kept inquiring by signs of his father what he should have him called. So they're sort of pushing away the poor woman. But Luke is always sensitive to women. I challenge any of you to find any woman in Jesus' presence who Jesus encounters who is not extolled and presented in the most beautiful light. There is none. Even the penitent woman. Woman, where are those that accused you? (laughs) Nor do I accuse you. Go and from now on avoid this sin. Jesus' love for women, it, it's communicated so beautifully here. So they're going, trying to go back to the Father. And asking for a writing tablet, he wrote the words, John is his name, affirming Elizabeth. All right, so they got the wood pit with the wax, the little stylus where he'd write, John is his name. Now, when he says, John is his name, writing that out, that's fulfilling, it's breaking, it's showing fidelity to the angelic message. Now we've had the birth, natural birth of John. Remember, the circumcision is the same thing as baptism. It's joyful. It's incorporation into the people of God. 
So this is a great moment. And right at this moment, as soon as this happened, they all marveled, and immediately his mouth was opened. See, he's faithful. He does what the angel said. His mouth was open and his tongue loose, and he began to speak, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were spoken abroad in the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Isn't that incredible? First of all, an old a woman of this age bearing a child, then breaking with the name, then the man who for nine months could not speak at all suddenly says his name is John, gives the name, supporting the wife. There's something in there about marriage too. Supports the wife, and then suddenly he can speak. Now think about it. You haven't spoken for nine months. What has he been thinking about for nine months? Nine months. After his saying... How's that going to happen? I'm an old man. All right? What does he say? And Zachary, his father, was filled with the Holy Spirit, just like his wife was now, and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and wrought redemption. You see how this is a total act of reparation now. He just glorifies God. The whole first part of this Benedictus is an expression of thanksgiving to God. And then the latter part, because he's filled with the Holy Spirit, is prophetic. He prophesies about his son. So the glory to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and wrought redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. A horn in biblical language means strength, power. All right? In the house of David, his servant, as he promised through the mouth of his holy ones, the prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us, to show mercy, again, notice mercy, to show mercy to our forefathers and to be mindful of his holy covenant, of the oath that he swore to Abraham, our father, that he would grant us, that delivered from the hands of our enemies, we should serve him without fear in holiness and justice before him all our days." That's the hymn of thanksgiving. You know, gratitude, as Chesterton said, is the greatest of virtues. And it's something that should always characterize us in the Christian life. When we ever get into the pity party moment, woe is me, how bad it is for me, just start thinking about your life. Every, you know, that we, that we can walk, that we can talk, that we have clothing, that, that we can see this freezing snow out there. But all of these things are, everything is a gift, Everything is a gift. And so after nine months, he realizes that and realizes what a supreme gift this is. Now after the thanksgiving, he starts to prophesy. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. He knows who is in Mary's womb. The prophet of the Most High. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Forgiveness of sins. That's why Christ comes, because we need to be forgiven our sins. Because of the loving kindness of our God, wherewith the Orient from on high has visited us to shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the way of peace is the way of God. It's being, you find peace, shalom, in the presence of God. Now remember what the state of the world was at this time. The darkness, the sin... All right. There was no confession to go to. There was no liberation. There was no way out. There needed to be salvation brought to us. And the birth of this child is going to do that. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts until the day of his manifestation to Israel. That's probably referring to the Judean wilderness. There's a lot of caves out there we could have hid, could have had shelter in those caves. There was bits of water here and there, but he lives out in that desert place, very ascetic even from his early life. Now, guess what? That's one chapter. Should we start chapter? We have time to do a little bit of chapter two. Okay, let's go on a little bit more into chapter two. Now it came to pass in those days that a decree went forth from Caesar Augustus that a census of the whole world should be taken. Notice again, he's a historian. He wants to locate the birth of Jesus. This is not some eons ago. This is in historical times, all right? Shortly after the supper parties of Horus, all right? 
Augustus is Caesar in Rome. He orders a worldwide census. We know that every 14 years he did a census. Some scholars used to say, oh, we don't know about this. Then we found in all these papyri in Egypt that there were censuses that were done every 14 years and even on a regular basis, either for population or for taxing purposes or for conscription into the military. It's very common. The more we learn about history, the more we realize Luke knew exactly what he was doing. The census of the whole world should be taken. This first census took place when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all were going each to his own town to register. And Joseph also went from Galilee out of the town of Nazareth into Judea to the town of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to register together with Mary, his espoused wife, who was with child. All right, so we go on. Again, he's emphasizing the fact that she is a virgin. And it came to pass while they were there that the days for her to be delivered were fulfilled. Again, that fulfillment message. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Probably one of the saddest verses in Scripture. No room in the inn. So she wraps him in swaddling clothes and lays him in a manger. This is the Son of God. This is the fruit of an angelic message. And there's no place in sorry, no room here, so we have to go off to a stable somewhere. But, again, the humility of God. It's not the priests in Jerusalem who come. It's nobody even in Bethlehem. It's the shepherds who were outcasts on the outskirts of the city. The most ignorant shepherds were considered horribly ignorant. They weren't righteous people at all. And there were shepherds, and Luke knows this, and there were shepherds in the same district in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. I found something that's really interesting. Do you know that the lambs that were raised for sacrifice in the temple, guess where they were raised? In Bethlehem. That's where the lambs that were sacrificed. So how totally cool (laughs) that the real lamb will be first acknowledged by the shepherds who were raising and tending the sheep that were used for the sacrifice in the temple. Okay, there were shepherds in the same district living in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of God shone round about them, and they feared exceedingly. So another angelic apparition. Zachary had one. Gabriel had one. We know that Joseph also got one from Matthew. Now the shepherds get one. And the angel said to them again, the words of consolation, Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news, tidings of great joy. Notice again, what's the word? Joy. And if we had more joy in our lives, if we really lived that message, the world would be very interested in what we're talking about tonight. And sometimes it's our own lack of joy that makes, you know, do you ever get together and have complaining sessions about the church and about the parish and about... Who would want to join such a... (laughs) All right. Instead of recognizing, yes... The church is made up of sinners. Thanks be to God, because we can be part of it. You know? Church was never perfect. It wasn't all Vatican II. Read Corinthians. That was founded by an apostle Paul. And there was all sorts of division and problems. It's always been an untidy affair. All right? But grace works. God writes straight through crooked lines. All right? News of great joy which shall to be all, to all people, notice the universality, to all people. For today in the town of David, remember the Davidic prophecy, a Savior, why? We've got to get rid of sin. A Savior has been born to you who is Christ the Lord. Notice, Savior, Messiah, Lord. All those affirmations. Savior, Messiah, Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. Who would have thought a sign like this? you will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So you can't go to the inn. You had to go out to the stalls outside the city to find a newborn child sitting in a manger. Remember Bethlehem, the word means house of bread? House of bread. And he's in a manger where you feed. Everything is Eucharistic. Everything is Eucharistic here. So we go on. And so suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men of goodwill. 
And it came to pass when the angels had departed from them into heaven that the shepherds were saying to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, just like Mary, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. So that's the sign. And when they had seen They understood what had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard marveled at the things told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept in mind all these things, pondering them in her heart. Bethlehem, one of the things that Dr. Carroll mentions, a special grace, maybe going back to the shepherds, understood, and they probably became the first Christians. But Bethlehem has always remained a Christian city. Do you know that down through history? Even to this day, it is a Christian city. When the Crusaders came there in the first crusade, the one town that opened its doors and gave them everything they needed was Bethlehem. You know why? It remained a Christian city. And it still is to this day. I don't know if that's a special grace given by the Lord because of his birth, but it remains a Christian city down to this very day. All right? And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, even as it was spoken to him. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through the rest of it. I'm I'm pretty much, I have five minutes? Okay, five more minutes. Okay, I'm going to go kind of quick then, all right, because I want to finish. All right. Now, when the eight days were fulfilled for his circumcision, his name was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The holy name of Jesus, Yahweh saves, because he comes as our Savior. Because the world is lost in darkness, and he is the light, he is the Savior. And when the days of her purification were fulfilled according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So they go up to offer him in the temple. This would be her purification 40 days after giving birth. And so they go up. Now just imagine she's bringing her son to present him to the temple. You think of all the lambs all the oxen, everything sacrificed throughout the history of the Old Testament, right? It's nothing compared to what Mary now brings to the temple, right? But do you see what she's bringing is a Eucharistic offering because she's bringing to the temple, to the house of God, what? The body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And it's the greatest offering. And so she brings the Son back to the Father, It's the greatest offering in salvation history, replacing everything that was done in the Old Testament in a supremely perfect way. And that is why, that is why, behold, there was in Jerusalem a man named Simeon, and this man was just and devout, looking, just like the shepherds were looking, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death until he had seen the Christ of the Lord. And he came by inspiration into the temple, into God's house. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he also received him into his arms and blessed God, saying, What a moment this must have been. Now thou dost dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word in peace. Now, again, remember, shalom means you're in the presence of God. You dismiss your servant in peace. Because my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory for thy people Israel. So, again, that universality. Light for the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were marveling at the things spoken concerning him. Why are they marveling? Because again, the Holy Spirit is operative and working and someone who they don't even know comes up and recognizes the child. So it's that presence of the Holy Spirit that is being operated. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary's mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign that shall be contradicted. Now Mary knew the Psalms. She knew what the sign, she knew there was going to be a suffering Messiah. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, there's two words in Greek for sword, and Luke here uses the one that means not little dagger,
but great big, like a Scythian sword. It's an enormous thing. This suffering was going to rip her apart. And remember, she's so humble. She's so pure. She is so immaculate. The greater the purity, the greater virtue, the greater the pain, right? When you really encounter evil and suffering, and it doesn't make sense, all right? Even though she knows with faith. Now, of course, it's interesting to note that this thing, this presentation, this is a joyful mystery in the rosary, right? doesn't sound very joyful when you hear your son's going to be a country. But think about it for a second. Think about it. It tells us so much about Mary and about love, and I'll have to end with this. When you really love someone, you really want to be with that person, right? And if there's someone that you really love is suffering and is going through horrible pain, what's the one thing you really want to do? You want to share in that pain. So if as a mother she hears about the suffering of her son, and it's going to be a sign that's going to be contradicted, when Simeon says, and the sword will also pierce your heart, what does she say? Be it done unto me according to thy word. I can suffer with my son. That's why it's a joyful mystery. Anyway, let's end with a prayer. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Here are the rules. We're going to go five minutes. I might give you seven. Five questions max. The questions are one sentence long and question mark on the end. Um, I was just wondering what you thought as far as uh, the date of Christmas as December 25th goes. Uh, I've heard a lot of criticism of that, that that wasn't the actual date and various reasons for it. What do you think of that? Well, you'll find a lot of people who talk about the 25th being related to the Roman celebration of the Saturnalia, which was sort of a winter solstice festival. But um, I can't remember all the arguments, but that's not, really, that's not really why. I think that was part of the way in which the pagans were prepared for this. Now, there is a way. I can't really remember all of this, but it goes something like this. There's even some astronomical studies about what might have possibly been the star of Bethlehem, and there was a fascinating configuration of, of Jupiter and Venus in the year 2 B.C. where it appeared to stop directly over Bethlehem before it did this retrograde action. It stopped over Bethlehem, if that was in fact the date, on December 25th. But one of the things, it's not just that the church has picked this. There are a couple of things that go to this, and it goes back to the Hebrew tradition. If he was of the course of Abia, Zachary, being, you know, serving in the temple, we know when those courses were, all right? Now, I can't remember the Jewish month reckoning, but if he served that, and then three days later she conceives then you can go back and you can plot this out, okay, that she was in the fifth, okay, in the sixth month of her pregnancy. That's when Mary conceives, all right? So if you actually plot it out properly, it does seem that there is not not totally conclusive, but there is a lot of evidence that points to December 25th as a likely date, which is one of the reasons why the Annunciation is always celebrated on the 25th of March and then nine months later. So it's not just, oh, they picked it because of the pagan Romans or something like that. That was a way in which, of course, they probably baptized, but even that was probably part of a pagan preparation in God's providential design that made it for the pagans an easy transition to go from Saturn to Jesus Christ. So there is a foundation for that, and there are other things you read. It's not just a, it's not just sort of, oh, let's pick it up and just pick that. There are foundations for it. It relates to the Jewish calendar relating to Zachary and Elizabeth's conception, then allowing us to do Mary, and then nine months out from that. Okay? If Mary had pledged her virginity from an early age, how then did she become betrothed to Joseph? Did you ever see Fiddler on the Roof? (laughs) I'll tell you. I don't know. (laughs) But it's a tradition, and without our tradition, I'll let... No, this is something that, that, something that is debated. There's a, there is an ancient tradition of Mary being consecrated to service in the temple. We know that although 
the whole Jewish tradition was for marriage and for having children. There was a tradition of celibacy. Paul never married. Elijah never married. A number of the great prophets never married, never had wives. So the notion of a consecrated virginity was not totally foreign. Uh, in addition, in the Qumran community, we know a little bit about them in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, a lot of the men were celibate and lived celibate lives. So it was not totally foreign to the mentality at that time. Now, it might have been that in order, maybe that Joseph and Mary had spoken, there might have been, I'm just conjecturing here, there might have been a mutual understanding between the two of them. That is possible. Certainly, I do think that a careful reading of the infancy narrative in Matthew uh, makes me tend to think that Joseph probably did, did expect to have normal relations with his wife, but once he received the angelic message, it was not, he really felt that he himself was unworthy of her, and that's why he was going to put her away, and that's why he steps back. There's a beautiful scene in Song of Bernadette, if you've ever seen the movie, where Jennifer Jones faints and the mother comes in and almost slaps her. She says, oh, I'm okay, Mom. Says, oh, I ran. I thought you were dead. But then Francois, the young man, says, as long as I live, Mother, I'll never forget the look on that girl's face. One ought not to touch a being like that. I said, that's really beautiful. Well, I'm sure it was some Mary who was full of grace. Joseph would have had the same type of reaction, but it took the angelic apparition to say, fear not to take Mary. And notice he said, Joseph, son of David, identifying him as the Davidic line because of the legal guardian and the legal protector and the bearing of that legality upon Jesus. Jesus was not only descended of David, probably through Mary biologically, but also legally through Joseph. So Joseph had a role to play. So I think they probably had some type of understanding. And it would not have been foreign for a young girl to have taken that type of vow. But why they went forward, maybe this was seen as part of God's overall design that Joseph is protector to nurture and to protect the child and to protect her reputation. Does that help at all? Okay. In the Bible, it says that Mary uh, traveled to Judah to visit uh, Elizabeth and Zachary. Uh, I can't imagine setting the scene that Mary traveled alone. How would she have traveled in those days? And she was there for three months. Where would Joseph be during this period? We don't know. The scripture doesn't really say. It seems that probably Joseph did not go with her uh, because they were not in their full marriage, you know. But it probably what happened, there were probably a caravan of women that would have gone. Uh, the kin were very, very close, and news of something like that would have been very significant. Um, it's possible that. Anne might have gone with her. We don't really know, but there probably would have been a group of women that probably would have traveled in caravan. I think it was about a 90-mile journey, and it was an arduous journey, something you should think about. Uh, if Ein Karim is the actual spot, I was blessed to have visited there, and it really is in the hill country. And uh, for her to travel, that would have been a very arduous thing, but to go in haste. So she probably went with some kin, possibly with her mother. Uh, to ass obviously, she was going to assist the cousin because of the revelation. So there might have been other relatives, probably women, that would have gone with her down to visit. I know you and I had this discussion, but I really want you to share it with others. And uh, how do we defend Mary's virginity after the birth of our Lord? And that's, you know, we all... A lot of us agree that she had no more children, so that's not the point. My question is that she remained her, retained her virginity when in the scripture it says Joseph did not know her until after the birth. That is a very good question. Well, we, a couple of things. One, the most important thing is the unanimous tradition. Scripture itself, but then the unanimous tradition coming from the apostles and all the fathers of the church, actually saying that Mary lost her virginity was condemned as a heresy. And this is not just, you know, Protestant thing. Luther, Calvin, many of the Protestant revolutionaries believed fervently in Mary's virginity and did not allow people to cast aspersions upon that. But the expression that you're talking about there, and they did not have relations until she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, what that is referring to is the, trying to show, not saying anything really about what happened afterwards. That verse is emphasizing that there were no relations to ensure that everyone knows absolutely clearly that the child, the offspring, is of God. It's of divine origin. That's what the verse is talking. And they had no relations until the child was born. It's not talking about what happened afterwards. 
It's talking about what happened before, because that's the primary theological point. That having been said, some people say, well, until, well, doesn't that imply? No, it doesn't imply. It's just like there was a passage in the Old Testament that said, and so-and-so had no more children until the day of her death. That doesn't mean she's having a baby at 85 on her deathbed. Does that make sense? So that word, the way it's presented in English, the only way we could use it, I kind of use this with you, I said, and I, I had no more McDonald's milkshakes until the day I died. I say I didn't have any more milkshakes for the rest of my life, but it doesn't mean I'm sick, sipping with Ronald McDonald. I'd be having Guinness probably on my deathbed. I would hope. Does that help a little bit? Okay. So it defends the virginal conception. Say going along with that, do you want to talk about the firstborn business? Um, how that might imply that there would be a secondborn? I know it's the same thing, and we all agree, but just to address that. Yeah, the firstborn, the expression firstborn is an honorific title enshrined in the old law, going back to Leviticus. So to say Jesus was firstborn in no way implies that there were other children. What it points out is his dignity as the firstborn, the male that opens the woman, so therefore he was specially consecrated to God. So it's an honorific title. It says nothing about what happened afterwards. A lot of times in some evangelical circles where they'll try to use this, these things can be easily refuted because they'll talk about, oh, the brethren of the Lord. They'll talk about James and, and things like that. And what you'll find out is that those people are identified as being descendant of Mary of Clovis. So they're not even, I mean, the scripture itself you know, refutes that position. So firstborn is an honorific title since he bore special consecration to the Lord God as being the, the firstborn that opened the womb. Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell, very much for being with us tonight.